Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. Today, we're going to talk about the combination of a web browser and cloud desktops to enable a DAS and zero trust security revolution. This webinar is brought to you in partnership with Aporto, and we're looking forward to discussing um, some pretty compelling technology uh, that a lot of organizations will benefit from over time. We have a number of great presenters today. First of all, I'm Scott Lowe. I'm the CEO and partner at Actual Tech Media, and I'll be your moderator and host for today's event. I'm also joined by my partner in crime, James Green, who is a VDI, DAS guru, and also a partner here at the company, and Mr. Scott Becker, who joined us recently as a webinar moderator and has deep experience with um, Microsoft technologies and um, desktops and all that good stuff. And from Aporto, we're joined by Anthony Awida, who is the CEO, and we'll be hearing from Anthony shortly. Before we get started, we do have, as always, just a few housekeeping items. First of all, I've already did introductions. Second, we have a $300 Amazon gift card to give away at the end of today's event. We will be announcing that gift card winner live at the end of the event. You must be present to win. And please make sure you follow Actual Tech Media wherever follower buttons are sold. Uh, we have lots of great events that come to you, lots of great content. And please also follow Aporto, all, all their social channels, and all that good stuff. In addition, there are a number of handouts, or a handout from Aporto you'll find on the handouts tab, and a couple from Actual Tech Media as well. So please make sure you review those. And if you have questions, we have $50. If you ask the best question during the event, you can win an Amazon $50 gift card. The prize winner will be selected by us and solely by us um, and will be contacted after the event. And don't forget, for both the Amazon $300 gift card as well as this gift card, you must meet the Actual Tech Media prize policy, which you can find at events.actualtechmedia.com. We're going to cover a lot today. Uh, before I get started, though, please ask questions. That's what we're here for, and we're going to make it worth your while. So we love questions. I want to make sure I can't um, stress that enough. We're gonna cover a number of things today. While I talk about what we're gonna cover though, I'm going to launch a poll question. And so while, that's, while I'm talking about the uh, sort of run a show today, we will have you answer this question. Basically, what do you use today? VDI, DAS, both or neither? What are you doing in terms of virtual desktops? Today, we're gonna to talk about a number of the challenges that are inherent with on-premises VDI and many DAS solutions that are on the market. We're also gonna discuss why a number of DAS solutions can create new security challenges for people. We'll also talk about why zero trust and traditional endpoints can sometimes be like oil and water, why there's challenges between these two things. We'll discuss the challenge behind VPNs and talk about outcomes, operational flexibility in the desktop environment, equaling endpoint success, equating to business results. And from a Porto, you'll hear about how they solve some of the VPN security issues that we're gonna discuss, how they avoid VDI complexity and how they can help your organization to get a shortcut to zero trust, which can be a very difficult uh, concept to permeate an organization. And we'll talk about shortcuts you can use to fully support organizations remote worker hybrid work plan. And with all that, let's see what we have for um, some of the results for our poll. This is a good audience. We have a lot of people that don't have either yet, so they have to do something. Um, so we want to uh, make sure we give you the best information possible today. And during our event today, we're gonna talk about some key issues. And the first one we're gonna do here is setting the stage. And I'm gonna be having Mr. James Green and Scott Becker join me for a discussion about what sort of things look like today from a remote work perspective, um, you know, the zero trust and some of the VDI and DAS solutions as they introduce you know, potentially new complexity to, to an organization. So I wanna start with you, Scott Becker, and I, I'm gonna be um, just calling him Becker during the event because we have too many Scots at the company. Um, <laughs> so Becker, you know, we talk about um, remote work and obviously everybody's been talking about this for a while now for obvious reasons. And it's really here to stay. Can you talk a little bit about some of the research you've seen that talks about what we're seeing in terms of remote work, particularly for knowledge workers? 
Yeah, absolutely, Scott. Um, so I'll defer to the, the analysts at Gartner on this one. They just released projections publicly in June for this calendar year, and they're estimating that by the end of 2021, we're going to have 51% of all knowledge workers worldwide working remotely. So that's nearly twice as many remote workers as there were in 2019. And, you know, for those of you wondering where the U.S. fits in that, the United States is, is the leader worldwide with about 53% of the, you know, the um, knowledge worker workforce expected to be remote in 2022. And, and one thing I want to make clear about Gartner is they use a hybrid definition for remote work. So they call a person who works at least one full day a week, um, they count them as remote. So it's a mix of, you know, fully remote and hybrid workers who spend part of their time in an office. So we're talking hybrid workers in addition to hybrid office situations where desktops are going to need to move from home office to on-premises and back. And organizations are going to need to be supporting both kinds of environments. Um, and, and clearly the surge is pandemic related, but at this point, at least, the bet from Gartner is on a lingering effect that lasts, you know, at least through 2024. Yeah, and if we think about remote work and, and particular uh, remote work more than hybrid work, we obviously saw the pendulum swing significantly to fully remote in 2020. Um, and it's shifting a little bit back in 2021. But what you're what you're saying is basically compared to 2019, we're a, we're a far cry from where we were. And this is going to be a permanent thing. Exactly. Okay. Um, you know, that introduces some, you know, interesting challenges. We have to have infrastructure for all these people. And it, and it really increases from a um, security standpoint an organization's security footprint. So that's something that has to be taken into consideration um, in all of these plans. Um, you know, at the same time, organizations have, uh, there's an urgent need around zero trust. They're looking for ways that they can get to a point to that they can secure their organizations as strictly as they possibly can while still allowing work to happen. Um, James, you know, um, Green, in, in your estimation, what are some of the biggest challenges around um, people adopting zero trust principles and actually getting from not where they are today to fully zero trust? Well, getting the stuff working and usable for all of your consumers, internal and external, uh, is kind of the problem with zero trust because in a greenfield scenario, the idea of zero trust is fairly straightforward and simple. Uh, I'm guessing that nobody here who's listening right now is gonna be doing that in a greenfield scenario, right? You'll have to back into zero trust by sort of adjusting things along the way. And so the problem then is, uh, one, a lot of the technologies you're using may not have been designed with this zero trust model in mind. And so you kind of got to twist their arm to get them to work that way. And the other thing is, th in a lot of time, in a lot of cases, the user experience um, needs to change or, or they access something in a different way. And so it, it's tough to go from not zero trust to backing all the existing things into zero trust. And for anybody who's listening who doesn't know that the idea of zero trust is essentially that um, many years ago, we had this idea of a network perimeter where you could secure the outside edges of the network, but everything inside was trusted. And uh, that perimeter basically doesn't exist anymore. That is partially due to this uh, remote and hybrid work thing that we're talking about, partially due to um, cloud, lots of stuff happening on mobile devices. There's many moving parts there that that mean that it no longer exists, the remote work being one of them, but there really is almost no perimeter, perimeter to speak of in many organizations today. And so zero trust is the idea of, uh, we can't just say because it's inside the network, we can trust it. We need to say on a very granular basis, this thing A can talk to thing B, but not to thing C and so on. Um, and so when it comes to remote work, that may impact for example, what internal resources a user can access unless they have been specifically granted that access, where in a, a network that was wide open, they could just get to whatever was internal that they needed. So um, yeah, you gotta be able to find ways to get applications that were not designed to work this way to play nice together, and that's hard. I'm going to launch our next poll question um, so people can respond to that while we chat. And this is, a, what are your current challenges with, you know, VDI and SaaS? And um, this is a multi-select, so please make sure that you select all that apply. Um, James, to your point, um, 
you know, zero trust, if again, in a greenfield environment is something that, you know, you can basically plan for from the beginning. But to, also to your point, these brownfield environments that are existing out in the world um, form the vast majority of the need to secure an organization. Um, and that means you've really got to look at every single aspect of the environment. Um, and that, that means that these are, are far more challenging undertakings um, than we would than we would uh, see with some other what we would consider IT or security projects. Um, we're going to be talking more about um, zero trust um, shortly, and uh, so I'm not going to belabor the point too much here. Um, but let's let's uh, get the results of our poll question and move on. So, lots of people have issues around reliability, um, the cost, and user experience, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at some of the things you're going to hear from Oporto. Um, later when we hear about these challenges that people are having with um, some of their, or that they've seen with some of the solutions that they have possibly um, tested in their environment or piloted. Um, our next topic is gonna be around some of the challenges that are inherent in on-premises VDI and traditional DAS solutions. Um, we think about DAS, this is basically desktops as a service uh, that we've heard um, that term come, on the, come in, the, in the way a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Um, essentially cloud-based desktops. Um, and I'm going to start again with um, Mr. Becker because I want to kind of get one thing out of the way here before we um, continue on. Um, one of the things, obviously, that we've seen over the years is Microsoft attempting to do a lot of work around, um, you know, providing desktops to to people via the cloud. Can, you know, you've, got, you've been covering Microsoft for 20 years as a journalist, and you've seen a lot of these things come and go. Can you provide some background on what they've done and sort of a little bit about what their new DAS offering looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I guess, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll do is just, I'll talk about, you know, Microsoft loves to put new products under a, a 365 umbrella, you know, so you've got Office 365, Microsoft 365, Dynamics 365, and now as of last month, you have Windows 365. And so just to quickly level set for those who sort of don't follow Microsoft's every technology and branding announcement with bated breath, um, you know, you've got Office 365, which is, that's the company's biggest SaaS offering. And loosely speaking, it's, you know, mostly Exchange Online with some SharePoint Online. All the Office applications like Word, Excel, et cetera, are thrown in as desktop downloads. And then more recently, Teams tying everything together. And then there's Microsoft 365, which is another brand and has some confusing branding overlaps with Office 365, you know, for different sized businesses. But a shorthand way to think of it is Office 365 with Windows desktop licenses included. And so this new kid on the block is Windows 365, which is, you know, Microsoft sort of long awaited entree into the desktop as a service market. There were some other vendors who, who uh, tried to do that with Windows and got you know, quickly slapped down about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, and then, you know, there was a, a lot of sort of anticipation for Microsoft to do something. Um, they're describing Windows 365 as a simplified version of Azure Virtual Desktop, the VDI product. And there are essentially two buckets of the Windows 365 products. You've got the business um, edition for organizations with 300 seats or less, and then enterprise uh, for those with more who want to manage the instances um, with uh, with Microsoft Endpoint Manager. And within each of those, you've got basic tiers with very limited capabilities, um, all the way up to a, a, a higher performance workload version. You know, and if you want to kick the tires on it, it's too late. They've reached capacity for Windows 365 trials, but uh, they're supposed to start again at some unspecified date. But so that's the basics of, of where they are with Windows 365. Um, I, but, you know, with your expertise, you know, both of you guys, I'd love to hear what you have to say about what the offering looks like. Yeah, I mean, I can talk real quick to that because um, we have a few other things we'd like to cover on this topic as well. Um, I actually have tried Windows 365. Um, it's serviceable. I mean, it's it is it's what Microsoft you know says it is, but it's it's not from an affordability perspective. I was surprised at how expensive it is. To be perfectly honest, mm. um, it's not an inexpensive offering, and the deployment process is. I mean, again, maybe if you're in a larger organization, it's a little easier, um, but the deployment process feels needlessly complex. It feels like it could have been pretty significantly streamlined, um, but they chose not to do that. Um, and there's still real-time performance challenges when we think about, you know, things like Zoom, which everybody's using these days, and some of those other sorts of technologies. So it's it's a 
it's a good solution for you know um, office workers, but when you get moves you know tr beyond that, um, I don't see. I still see that there's some significant challenges that it has. Um, James, there's also, you know, this, I, this, let's talk about performance in general in VDI and DAS environments. And this includes, um, you know, Amazon workspaces. This includes, you know, um, you know, VMware VDI on the premises and Citrix and all this other stuff. Can you talk about where we've seen performance and complexity challenges, especially since you've designed these kinds of solutions in the past, um, pretty directly? Yeah, sure. So, you know, at the end of the day, when you are designing and deploying a VDI or DAS solution, um, the most critical thing to get right, the thing you cannot mess up, is the user experience. Because when you roll this out, they're going to be, every user is comparing the experience that you're delivering right now with the experience that they have on the laptop sitting in front of them. And if it's not as good, they're going to be frustrated. And so what you're up against is basically deploying something that will have the same, uh, you know, low level of latency, high level of graphics performance as what they're used to sitting on the desk in front of them, except delivered over the network from far away. And that's, that's pretty tricky. <laughs> a lot of organizations have tried and failed. A lot of consultants have made a lot of money figuring out how to do this. And it's hard. A um, couple of big problems being Networking considerations, obviously, you've got to operate this desktop from the other side of the country, maybe, as opposed to sitting on the desk, as well as the infrastructure that powers these desktops. And um, that you have to design very carefully. And what gets a lot of folks is it's different than designing a similar cluster for servers because the workload is quite a bit different. And so, uh, you know, IT folks who have spent a lot of time building out clusters of servers. Of, of you know, host nodes to host servers, we'll go and build it the same way and find out. Whoa, the you know I/O characteristics of these desktops are completely different, and the density is different, and the networking is different. So it's hard to get right. Also, yeah. necessarily to solve that problem, it's very complex, and so you can go the DAS route to get rid of some of the complexity, make that somebody else's problem. That has its own problems, namely uh, cost is a big one. The cost and I would say location for, you know, uh, in a lot of cases, especially if you're sort of, um, particularly if you're looking at on-premises DAS, but even with some cloud-based DAS, um, the further you get away, the more the latency becomes an issue. So there's a geo issue in some cases as well. Um, you know, to your point about performance, I, we were joking before this event about, you know, VDI, especially, there were these calculators that would you'd have to figure out to figure out how many spinning disks you needed, and what you ended up with was six thousand disks for with one terabyte of capacity just because you needed the IOPS. So there was a lot of complexity um, that's gotten simpler, but it's still pretty complex to deploy, um, and especially in an era where we have people that are not necessarily just working from home but working from anywhere. Um, the desktop really needs to follow the user in a lot of ways. Um, so as we go from, you know, home to, uh, you know, vacation or whatever, where we're, or a sec, you know, however people are working, um, we want to make sure the experience stays consistent um, and performant so people can actually get their work done. Um, and that's, you know, that can be pretty challenging in a lot of traditional scenarios. Uh, we're going to move on in just a second here. Um, before we continue, I want to make sure uh, everybody remembers to ask questions. We have one question so far that we'll get to um, later in the presentation from Ted Wang. Um, but please, if you have questions, please ask them because we are here to ask to answer them. Um, we're going to share the results of this poll um, with a question, and I launched it secretly. Um, how about concerned are you about security with remote and virtual workers? And the answer is... Um, uh, not great. Um, only, you know, 8% of you said, this is great. Um, a lot of you didn't. And um, that's a that's a concerning statistic, especially when we think about the fact that we've increased the security perimeter or attack surface of our organizations with a lot of remote work that's going on. Let's move on to our next topic, which is security again. So why a lot of the DAS solutions that are out there can often create new security challenges. And this is going to talk to um, some of the things that we just have to make sure we can take care of when we have uh, our DAS solutions out there. 
And let's start with the client, James. Again, let's let's go back to your um, discussion um, in your your world before. Um, talk about how people accessed and the uh, the solution. And I think that one of the things that's important to understand is some of these solutions ended up doubling the number of managed endpoints because we then had a physical and a virtual one. So can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. So obviously, if somebody's going to be using a virtual desktop that lives elsewhere, they still need some physical thing in front of them to access that with. What you see in a lot of cases is that the organization either wants to reuse equipment they already have, meaning, you know, their most uh, recent past deployment, they had rolled out some desktops and some laptops, and those are ready for a refresh. But rather than refresh them, they're going to turn it into just an endpoint for accessing a virtual desktop. You also see, you know, a lot of organizations implementing a BYOD sort of thing where, you know, hey, you bring whatever you want, you connect that to your virtual desktop. Um, even like Chromebook sort of things used as endpoints. So there's lots of ways that people can access them. But the important consideration for pretty much all of those, with a few exceptions that I can touch on in a minute, the important consideration is you essentially now have two endpoints. You have the device that you're using to access the virtual desktop, and then you have the virtual desktop itself. And so instead of having to secure, you know, 100% of the endpoint devices, now you have to secure 200% of the endpoint devices. And uh, for, you know, especially the DAS solutions, like you mentioned, those are going to require a client to run on the device that you're connecting from to, to make that connection and do the rendering of the desktop. Those things, that, that is basically a way into the infrastructure as well and becomes a security concern. Yeah, and that has to be managed at some, at some point. I mean, when you think about mobile device management or endpoint management, um, you know, you're, you're securing whatever laptop people are wandering around with this client. Um, and so from a security, per, again, I know perimeter sort of a dated term, but, you know, the, it's still valid in this, in, this, uh, in this context. You basically massively expand your perimeter. If I could just add one more thought, uh, tying back to the conversation we were just having about performance and end user experience and that kind of thing. If somebody has a, a laptop sitting in front of them that is a fully featured, you know, say Windows operating system, and what they're supposed to be doing with it is firing it up, loading the client, connecting to their corporate desktop. They're going to do that for as long as it works for them. But as soon as they have a bad experience, uh, they try and get on a video call through that desktop and it, it won't work. They try and, you know, install an application and you've kept them from doing that in the virtual desktop. What they're going to do is they're going to come outside the virtual desktop and do it on the laptop, which is really not something you want happening. But I can tell you for sure from experience, that's what's going to happen. So um, that's a major risk when you have that second endpoint outstanding. Yeah. And that's um, like to your point, that becomes another you know potential entry point into the network. Um, and at the same time, from a security perspective, we need to be thinking about compliance with regulatory frameworks like HIPAA and stuff like that. Um, that starts to become challenging when we have more and more devices out there that we have to manage, especially if we have to start managing both the access endpoint as well as the virtual one. Um, so those are things that I think that we can't overlook when we talk about the potential security challenges that can be introduced by um, some DAS solutions that are on the market. One thing that we uh, also did here is we launched another poll. Um, we'll be launching a poll with each of our topics, so please make sure you pay attention to that. We love your feedback. And the question is, what's the status of your zero trust initiative? And 31% of you have started, don't have plans at this point to start um, any kind of a zero trust initiative. Some are starting next year and the other ones have secured either their network um, or their network and their endpoints. Um, nobody responded that they have end to end yet. Um, and that's interesting because that's, again, I think the, the holy grail, the promised land of, as it were, for what we try to accomplish when it comes to zero trust. Um, and no one here so far um, has, um, you know, uh, gotten there. Um, I'm going to bring a question up. And the question is um, from Eric Caverly. And it's, and James, maybe you can think, of, think about this one a little bit. Um, our management finally feels like security is a priority. Their top concern is ransomware. Should we be more focused in other places first? I'm not sure. I mean, honestly, the endpoint and ransomware are, I mean, that's where ransomware comes in. Yeah. Um... 
the top concern is ransomware. Should we be more focused in other places first? I mean, um, I don't know, actually. I, I might be a little bit biased right now because I'm personally spending a lot of time thinking and, and writing and speaking about ransomware, but I'm not sure, actually, what is a bigger threat to organizations right now than ransomware. It's um, The statistics are absolutely startling. And we've done uh, a number of live streams on our LinkedIn page over the past couple of weeks about that. If you want to go find those, we share those statistics, but it's bad. And um, the other thing we're seeing in the statistics, besides how, how prolific it is, is how few organizations are successfully defending against it and recovering from it without some level of damage. A lot of them kind of partially recover or, you know, um, stifle the, the fallout but not entirely. And so uh, I'm inclined to agree with them. If, if nothing else to say, it's a top three thing. That is, that is critical. And the, the, the entry point for that is the users and the endpoints. So I do think you need to be thinking about that a lot. Yeah. And, and can I just go ahead, Becker? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in with one other thing, which is there, there is one silver lining of ransomware and that it's, it's such an umbrella category. It, it, you know, affects so many areas of security that if your, your management is focused on ransomware, say, great, here are the security solutions that we need all over the organization um, to defend against it. Yeah, one of the things that I've um, been preaching for a very long time is that ransomware defense is a multi-layered defense. Um, and securing your desktops, having a secure desktop environment and, uh, and a culture of security in your organization are the really the biggest things that are going to prevent ransomware from infiltrating in the first place. Um, because the vast majority of ransomware events are because someone made a mistake somewhere. Um, and it's not malicious, um, typically, typically anyway, um, but it's just reality. It's humans. Humans make mistakes. Um, so that was a great question, Eric. Thank you for asking that. I'm going to move on to our next topic, um, which is going to be around basically the endpoint and zero trust and why it can be really challenging to get to fully zero trust um, in an endpoint. And, you know, we're going to start with um, what we just discussed. And I'm, while we do this, I'm going to launch our poll right now. Um, so give me just one second. So because we have um, this is a really interesting one for, for us. I, I, this is for me particularly interesting because I'm I'm sort of fascinated by this migration to work from home into hybrid. And so I'm really interested to hear what's happening um, out there with our, with our folks that are on, the, that are on this event. Um, we just talked about how cybersecurity issues take place. And you know, statistics show that 70 to 80% of cybersecurity issues happen because of users. Users did something wrong. And again, it's not malicious. And I will give credit because the, the bad guys have gotten really good at their jobs, unfortunately. Um, and there have been a few emails I've received that look really good and really legitimate, but but aren't. Um, and no, I have not fallen victim yet, um, but they're, they're getting good. And if you don't live and breathe this and have a culture of security in your organization, it can be very difficult to fully avoid um, falling victim to a security attack. Um, and, you know, Let's talk about zero trust and endpoints. James, what makes it so hard to, to secure endpoints and get to a true zero trust model um, at the same and traditional endpoints at the same time? Well, I feel like a little bit like I'm beating a dead horse here, but um, it comes back to the user experience. You could very well just you know lock down access to everything and then say, okay, now send me a request for what you need to get through to and I'll whitelist that as the requests come, and it will be a disaster, <laughs> and you you will have a horrible reputation internally. Um, but so the, the challenge is, how do you start to protect these things without ruining the user experience, especially in a brownfield deployment scenario? Um, uh, <laughs> it's really hard. I'm, I was going to try and give a piece of advice there, but I'm not even sure I have any other than we need a, a bit of a different approach because zero trust in the way I think of it and trying to back into that without a, a technology that has kind of reimagined it, it's really tough to do. And, you know, I'll jump in here with talk and to kind of bring this back to the work from home thing. Um, you know, the uh, 
key technology that's sort of you know under underpinned the work from home or especially early on um you know hybrid scenarios is vpn um and endpoint security technologies and things like that but one of the challenge you know i think that security and complexity are polar opposites things you don't the more complex something is the, the less secure it is because people can't figure it out or there's just too many moving parts. So as we have to have add these layer technologies like VPNs, more endpoint security, more of this, more of that, I feel like there's an exponential increase in complexity, which require which ends up with, um, you know, a, a, an overall reduction in your security footprint or security posture, um, and especially early on, as people were struggling to enable work from home it was basically just throw it out there and make it work. Um, and then we'll add all this stuff later, but it adds complexity. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I completely agree with you about complexity being the problem. Like we were talking about a minute ago on the ransomware thing where users are the source of uh, ransomware infiltration a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time. Users are also the source of cybersecurity failures a lot of the time. And I think, I don't have a stat to back this up, but I think in a lot of cases, that's probably due to complexity. If it were easier, it would be less likely for human error to have been the problem. But in an effort to engineer you know, a really solid security posture, we layer on one piece of complexity on another piece of complexity on another one, and it becomes really hard to manage and keep up to date um, by humans. Yeah, and I'm going to tie this back to one concept we've used for years, which is this idea of least privileged access, which has a lot of, uh, which basically is one of the tenets of zero trust too, right? You have to get to a point, I mean, zero trust means you don't trust anything, you give just enough to what people need to do their jobs. Um, unfortunately, on the desktop side of the equation, to make things easier for the user, we've often just said, okay, we're going to give you local admin rights, or we're just going to, you know, we're going to solve this application problem by increasing rights over here or something like that. So we've had to make workarounds to solve user issues or make the user experience more palatable at the at the cost at the expense of security in some ways. Um, so it's uh, and that's been one of I think one of the challenges we have around zero trust. And that's why we see this idea that these things are are kind of not mutually exclusive, but why doing the endpoint right and doing it well can actually help you accelerate zero trust faster. Um, so we'll get to that here shortly in just uh, in just a second. I want to talk about the results of our poll and we'll move on to our next topic. Um, so this is not unexpected. Um, in fact, this pretty well aligns with what we just heard from Becker, um, which is around fifty one percent. I mean that 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 bucket there um, looks you know pretty well where we are. So I'm going to move on to our next topic because we want to make sure we have plenty of time. Let's talk about VPNs. Um, and I, I think for this one, I'm going to go to, I'm going to first of all launch our, actually, I don't have a poll for this one. Um, so Scott, you have some thinking around some VPN security um, stuff you've seen. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So VPN security has been um, all over the news lately and, and not really in a good way. Um, and I'll just mention two examples where, where VPN security was at the center of a story. Um, one is a, a set of vulnerabilities that FireEye disclosed in April. Uh, and so that, you know, the security company found a dozen malware families uh, being used by multiple hacking groups. Um, they were exploiting vulnerabilities in, in Pulse Secure VPN, and that was hitting defense contractors, financial institutions, and governments. And it, you know, it was a it was a sort of a high end attack, um, you know, relatively limited in in, in number, um, you know, by apparently sophisticated actors. But the uh, you know, the, and the malware included slow pulse that can get around a, a two factor authentication uh, defense. And the other huge one um, was the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack from May. And a lot of people don't associate that with, with VPNs, but you know, that was the one that caused a spike in gas prices that you uh, probably remember hitting your wallet if you're on the East Coast. Um, but in, in June, the company's CEO testified, I think before the US Senate, that the problem originated with an old VPN technology uh, that didn't require two-factor authentication. So that's just sort of two recent examples of, of uh, huge issues. Um, that have happened around VPNs. 
And there's two more stats I'd like to bring up on this one. And number one is that according to Gartner, 70% of remote workers are still using VPNs in some way, shape or form. Um, and to, to your point, there's all kinds of news about where there have been VPN issues, whether that's an enterprise grade VPN tool or whether that's something you you know buy as an app. Um, there are known security issues, especially with some of the other app ones that are around these days, app based ones, um, that are that are becoming in the coming into the limelight that that are not positive. And also, to your point about um, the Colonial Pipeline, forty to fifty percent of cybersecurity hacks are uh, use the VPN as the entry point. That's huge, and so it's it's an area that requires um, either a lot of attention or a complete rethinking. Um, and I think probably the the latter is where a lot of organizations really need to be thinking about um, thinking about going. Um, so let's, again, I wanna make sure we have time to keep going here. So I'm just gonna get to our last point. Um, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but let's talk about basically what this really means. The, the key points that we need to talk about here are what are we trying to achieve with our, end, with our endpoint environment? And we're trying to make sure applications get to users. We need to make sure we can have um, master images and variants that make sense for each individual user or user department. Um, so we don't wanna have the same desktop to the same people. And we need to make sure that that process for managing those desktops isn't cumbersome and doesn't create operational complexity for IT that ultimately would make things either less secure or less efficient. Um, we have to think about things like application virtualization, you know, the performance side of things and making sure that we have desktops, virtual desktops that remain performant, regardless of user location. Whether if that user you know, travels from St. Louis, Missouri to you know, um, New York City, we wanna make sure that that virtual desktop that they're accessing in the cloud actually stays running well. Um, thanks to James and Mr. Becker for joining me for this for first part of the webinar. I'm gonna turn it over now to um, the Porto CEO, Anthony. Anthony, are you here? I'm I'm here. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. It's it's your show. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, guys. That was a terrific introduction, and I hope the I'm sure the audience agrees. So uh, I think one question was posed in the Q and A. Um, you know how long we've been around, and so Aporto has been around for six years. We have 180 customers. Uh, most of them based in North America. Uh, we use data centers across the country, data centers with um, Amazon and Microsoft Azure. We also host our service in data centers of our customers. We have obviously customers who for a reason or another, which could be performance or could be security, prefer to host um, our service within their data center. So one of the things we set out to do is obviously to re remedy some of the problems that um, Scott and, you know, and, and his team talked about. And the two problems that we, the words we've heard repeatedly during the conversation are VPN and endpoint. So what we've decided to do is create virtual desktop technology that delivers all applications in the browser. And we call it a near native user experience, which means that and our end users are using applications, very demanding applications like SolidWorks or AutoCAD or even video conferencing. And the end user should not be able to tell the difference between using his native computer and his virtual computer in the browser, which is very, very hard to do because the browser obviously is not always as performant as a native application, but we spent a lot of engineering effort to make sure that it does. For that matter, I have with me our VP of engineering, uh, James. James, are you on this call? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me, Anthony? I can hear you very well. Thank you, James. And uh, James, uh, the first thing is that James uh, is using this video conference through the Aporto virtual desktop. And I'm gonna let him speak the just uh, in, in a few minutes. And if this video conference was using also video, you would be able to see uh, James 
and the user experience, you would be able to see him as if James was using his native uh, video conferencing capability. James, perhaps you can explain to us what are some of the technologies that you brought to bear to deliver this great user experience and make sure that everything can run and run almost natively in the browser. Thank you, Anthony. So uh, there's actually a lot of different strategies technologically that we've used to optimize this experience. So as we kind of heard earlier in the conference, you know, there's a lot of obstacles for delivering, let's say, a, a desktop experience over the, the internet related to things like latency, uh, the ability and performance of like, for example, like 3D applications and having that real near native experience. And so what we've done here at Porto is that we've leveraged uh, advanced codecs like H.264, uh, technologies like uh, WebRTC, data channels, uh, and, and continue to push the envelope to ensure that we're providing the best possible connection to the end user uh, and optimizing that connection in the best possible way so that you can run a full CAD application, for example, uh, inside of your virtual desktop and have it stream back to your browser and not notice any difference uh, in, in that piece. We, 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 we do this and we do this in a secure way, right? Because we, because we keep everything in the browser and that's like a mantra that we, we have in everything that we do, we've reduced that security footprint to just being able to deliver a browser. And what's going on on that native user's desktop is just not our concern um, because they can't get in uh, that we, we, we have that, 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 uh, that barrier there between the, the browser and uh, their native desktop. We also support, uh, uh, we also have a, a strategy of geo-optimization. So we have data centers all over the country. And so we're able to position users close to, uh, to their closest data center. And that also improves the, the overall latency and experience uh, and giving that, that real native feel to the day-to-day -day use. Thank you, James. In, in fact, um, Mike Kelly just asks a question that's very relevant to what we're discussing. And he says there are several users in remote areas of California and they have low bandwidth connections to the internet. What are the minimum bandwidth requirements? So our experience is that what tends to be lim the limiting factor is not the bandwidth. We do so much compression that most of the time, um, even for video conferencing or watching a YouTube, we're talking about two, three, four, five megabits per second, w uh, which everybody you know has in this day and age. What tends to be the limiting factor is the network latency. So if your users are using a virtual desktop and the data center for that virtual desktop happens to be on the East Coast, we're fighting, they're fighting the speed of light even at the speed of light, which is almost the speed at which the, the packets travel, you're going to have to have a network latency of 100, 120 milliseconds. And that has a huge impact on the user experience if they're using things like 3D applications or if they're using things like video conferencing. So this is why a very key part of our technology is that when a user connects, we figure out where they're connecting from using geo-optimization, and we connect them to the closest data center, which ensure that they have a great user app, uh, experience for all their applications. Um, there's another so question, the other... um, um, Anthony, I think to be interesting is, this is, uh, I think, core to what Aporto is providing is the question, do you have an on-prem solution as well? I mean, I think it's important for people to understand what this yeah specifically yes, is. Yes, absolutely. We, we have customers who are using our on-prem solution for a number of reasons. We have customers who have to deal with HIPAA, who have to deal with FERPA, and they cannot allow some of their data to leave their, you know, to leave either their data center or geographical location. So we can deploy very simply our solution within your data center. All we need is a VM, and again, the specs of the VM depends on the number of users, et cetera, but all we need is a VM and it will be part of our infrastructure, an extension to our infrastructure. Okay. So um, 
uh, obviously, the, the second part of it is that, you know, we heard the colonial pipeline and the key problem with the colonial pipeline was that they were using AD, they were using AD authentication. And, you know, brute force now is becoming very, very easy with all the compute power that the hackers have. So implementing multi-factor authentication is very important, but also implementing multi-factor authentication with a very good source of data. A, one where you have, you know, a lot of the information about the profile of the users. It could be for your HR system. Very often you rely on AD as your source of profiles, but AD does not have all the information. So to the extent that you can leverage, you know, um, multi-factor authentication, integration with HR systems, you are much better off in order to deliver the right applications and only the right set of applications, the right set of data to the right users. And this is what we do. Any other uh, questions, Scott, I should tackle before I move to the next slide? Yeah, there's one, I think, an interesting question that um, is not necessarily directly related to the product, but it's more strategic and in internal or for organizations. And it's, how do you decide which users need VDI, which require DAS, and which can just use VPN? I mean, what, what's the calculus that has to be made there? Um, and how does that, how does Porto sort of address that? Well, I mean, VDI, he, here's the challenge with VDI. And we've, uh, you know, one third of our customer base comes from traditional VDI. The biggest challenge is that in a VDI environment, you have to figure out what your peak workload is going to be. You're going to have to purchase hardware, software, infrastructure for that peak workload. And now that peak workload may happen two times, three times a year. So you end up with this very complex, very expensive environment that is probably only used twice or three times a year. And when it's fully utilized, probably the user experience deteriorates. In the cloud, we have innovated very advanced auto-scaling technologies so that when there is less capacity that's needed, we stop the servers automatically without the users even knowing about it. And now we're not paying for it. You're not paying for it. We need more capacity. We add capacity on the fly. And now end users have a great consistent user experience at all times without having to pay for that infrastructure all the time. Okay, moving along. So one of the things we've innovated as well is what we call desktop variants. And the idea behind desktop variants is one of the key tenets of zero trust is that users should have only access to the, what they absolutely need. So if somebody just needs a browser, a secure browser, that's all they get. They don't even have access to the canvas, to the operating system. If somebody needs all the applications, but they don't need access to the SAP GUI, they won't see it. It's not available to them. So in our environment, you create a super image for all of your applications. And then using checkboxes in a very simple way, you can say for this group, I'm going to publish those applications. For this other group, I'm going to publish those other applications. And it's very simple to manage because, again, it's just checkboxes. You have like a matrix. You publish those applications to those groups of users and the other users don't even know about it. They can't even find it in their virtual desktop. The other thing that you can do is one of our customers is Emory Universities and Emory University hosts the CDC. So as you can imagine, they are very concerned about data upload, data download, copy and paste and whatnot. So in our environment, you can turn off a lot of the features that make a virtual desktop less secure for a specific group of users. So you can turn off upload, download, copy and paste, a lot of the features that can be turned off to make the environment even more secure for a specific group of users, but not for everybody else. Any questions, Scott, I should handle before I keep moving? Um, we'll take some questions at the end. I want to make sure we get through your material. Yes, thank you. Okay. So um, I'll keep moving here. 
So really, the one message, hopefully, you know, that you want to keep here is that we've created an environment just like Salesforce.com. There is a lot of complexity underneath Salesforce. You know, there's a lot of security underneath Salesforce. But you, as an admin, don't have to worry about that. Of, of course, you still have to manage the environment, but it's a very simple UI. All the underlying complexity is hidden from you. And this is the environment we've created. We've created an environment where from one console, you can manage multiple data centers, including data centers that may be on-prem in your locations. Um, it's, it's very simple. If you look at the demo, every time we show our environment to a customer, you know, their takeaway is that it's very, very simple. We typically set up our customers in about two weeks. And we use auto scaling, as I mentioned earlier, we take care of the backup and the recovery. We, we have an outside firm of experts that's conducting all the time, automated and expert pen, pen testing. So you don't have to worry about that we deliver on your service level agreement. In other words, if you have a service level agreement internally with your internal customers, we will undertake that on your behalf. And one thing is our pricing is very attractively priced. We got started in the higher education. As you probably know, higher education is very price sensitive and we are able to deliver the service at a very low cost on a concurrent user basis. One of the things that's preventing existing VDI customers from moving to the cloud of those VDI vendors is that if you're using something like Citrix or VMware, you're probably paying on a concurrent user basis. If you try to move to the cloud, they're going to ask you to move on a named user basis, which becomes very, very expensive very quickly we deliver it on very attractive concurrent user basis. Yeah, I don't think you can overstate the importance of that concurrent user pricing um, and, and moving to the cloud. That's, that's a pretty key differentiator. We do have a number of questions that have come in. I'm going to launch um, on our next poll while we, um, while we ask some questions. And I think this one is a very interesting one because application virtualization has, from a, in a VDI environment, um, okay, not even just VDI, but application virtualization altogether has often been very challenging. How do you handle custom applications? Can those be virtualized? Uh, sorry, is, uh, are those custom applications, are they current applications or are they Windows 7 application or earlier? Uh, and and the, the short say. answer... Okay, the short answer is we can handle those. I mean, again, as you can imagine, we have now 180 customers. We have virtualized some 500 applications. And, you know, we have access to servers uh, that run, you know, older versions of the Windows operating system, the Windows Server operating system. So to the extent that those applications run on, you know, anything between Windows 2012 and subsequent versions, there should be no problem to supporting those. Um, next question is overall reliability of the Aporto service. Um, how many nines, I guess, is what they're looking for? So our commitment, our SLA is 99.99 because everything we do is redundant in our environment. There is no single point of failure. If you look at our status page, we had only one failure in the last year, and this was caused by a network failure failure in the Microsoft Azure um, data center. Um, so, um, you know, we've had very, very, very few failures. Um, what about browser support? What browsers do you support for access to desktops? Any HTML5 browser uh, we support. Uh, we test on the four most prevalent uh, browsers, um, obviously uh, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, and Safari. And the underlying operating system, quite kindly, we don't care about. I mean, we have end users sometimes who will call us and they say, you know, I'm doing something really quick here on my cell phone. So I launched the virtual desktop and I'm doing this. So we do see in our statistics that 
is, you know, it, there is a sizable minority of users who use even non-traditional devices, iPad, iPhones, and the like. A um, couple more questions. Um, how do you ensure data security for customers working from remote locations through the cloud without having to place a significant burden on the internal IT team? You know, like I said, uh, I think that question really deserves a more detailed discussion. But if you're using Salesforce.com, you probably do not spend a lot of time worrying about the security of your data. You've outsourced that problem to Salesforce.com. Similarly, if you work with us, you will not spend a lot of time worrying about the security of that data. You've outsourced that problem to us. We have a question that um, came in a few minutes ago, and it's, is there an organizational size threshold that makes it, where it makes sense to migrate away from app-based VPN, in your opinion? I mean, obviously I have a biased perspective, um, but to me, like, it, it, in fact, actually this is what you guys said, which is, you know, VPN and security are a little bit like oil and water, right? I think in uh, I've been watching this, and in the last two years, there has been no less than eight VPN vendors who have announced security um, exploits in their technology. No less than eight, even the very top ones like Palo Alto Networks and others. <clears throat> so, um, to me, you know, again from a bias perspective, I think VPN are a huge security loophole. And the further, the fastest we can get away from that technology, the better off will everybody be. Um, I'm, gonna have to, I'm gonna ask two more questions. Um, the first one is a technical question and I gotta find it. Give me a second here. It was around basically older hardware and compression. Um, just a second. Oh, there it is. When using compression, yeah. is the quality affected by remote uh, by remote hardware, like older processors, video cards, things like that? Yeah, really good question, actually. So when so we use H.264, and as you probably know, the H.264 relies a little bit on the GPU to optimize the user performance. But even if there is no GPU in the client hardware, uh, we will go back to using the CPU. So I think somebody who has updated hardware will have a slightly, maybe 10, 15% better user experience than otherwise, but it's not a huge difference. We rely mostly on the CPU to deliver the user experience that end users expect today. I think this next, this last question that we'll ask revolves around, um, you know, the sense I'm getting is that it revolves around people's reticence to, for, allow someone else to access their data. The question is, does Aporto use our enterprise's data in any way? Network traffic, application use files. Like, what do you need hooks into, as I believe what the person's asking? This is your data. This is toward, you know, um, in, in your environment, this is your data. Um, we don't have access to your data. Um, I'm not sure I had a percent actually, you know, uh, understand the question, but this is your data. Okay. Um, Anthony, thank you very much for that great presentation. Thank you for explaining how the Aporto solution addresses a lot of the challenges that James and Scott Becker and I um, discussed early on in the presentation. And we have um, one thing left to do, and that's to give away a $300 Amazon gift card. And the winner is me. No, I'm kidding. Um, the winner is Don Rutledge from Texas. Don, we'll be reaching out to you after today's event with information on how to collect your winnings. Thank you very much to Aporto for sponsoring this event. Thank you to um, Anthony and James Dixon for their presentation. Thank you to my team here at Actual Tech Media for putting on the presentation. And thank you, most importantly, to our audience for being here, paying attention, asking great questions, and participating. Everyone, please have a wonderful and safe rest of your week.